Hello everyone and good evening. Dr. Domkowski here and welcome to another live presentation from our bariatric surgery program at Sebastian River Medical Center. We're glad you can join us. Remember this is a live presentation so feel free in the comment section to send in your questions during our presentation should they come up and we'll be happy to address them at the end of the uh, informational session. We thought we'd speak about tonight a very important topic, uh, one that's not spoken about a lot and one that there's really not a great deal of information out there about it. And it's called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And it's a disease that's intimately associated with obesity disease. We often in the medical field will refer to it as NAFLD, which is the acronym N-A-F-L-D, NAFLD. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is a silent disease and I see it all the time obviously in this line of work when we ask a patient have they ever been diagnosed with fatty liver disease, the answer is generally no. And most people with a body mass index of 35 or higher uh, will generally have uh, NAFLD but they don't know it, has not been diagnosed by a previous doctor and so we thought it was an interesting and important topic to discuss tonight. Just in terms of its prevalence within the United States, it's estimated that 100 million adults have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So that's basically one in three adults. One in 10 children also have NAFLD. Now what specifically is it? Fat is stored in the liver and these are called hepatocytes. And when these hepatocytes become filled with an adiposity or an adipose load, they swell and become enlarged. And if you were to take a biopsy of the liver and look at it under a microscope, you would see enlarged or swollen hepatocytes. Now the liver is a very spongy organ. Think of a, a sponge you'd use in your kitchen. When you squeeze it, it's soft, it's pliable. That's how a healthy liver is. When you develop fatty liver disease, it becomes much more stiff, less pliable. When you hit it or squeeze it, it's not as uh, spongy. You can't, it's much more firm. And that's one of the gross distinctions between a healthy liver and an unhealthy liver or NAFLD disease. Now why is this important to speak about? Because if the disease progresses, it can become something else called NASH syndrome, which we'll get into in a few slides, which is non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. I know I'm throwing around a lot of terms that you know, uh, are commonly used in medical uh, communications and jargon, but they're important for you in terms of what the disease means, and I'll be sure to highlight it whenever I'm speaking about that. The risk factors for NAFLD, or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, how I'll refer to it from now on, are obesity disease, as I mentioned, hypertension, high blood pressure, elevated cholesterol, or triglycerides, and then those that have developed type 2 diabetes or insulin resistance. Some people uh, aren't diabetic, but will be shortly, and the first signs of that are insulin resistance when their body stops processing glucose. Now remember, glucose is shuttered, or shuttled excuse me, to the liver where it's stored as glycogen, and that glycogen is the fat. So a lot of times people will develop fatty liver disease and we'll see it when we do the surgery, and people will say, well, how do I get liver fibrosis? I don't drink. Or how did I get cirrhosis? I don't drink alcohol. Because typically, we associate consumption of alcoholic beverages with liver disease. That's kind of you know, the way tradition has it. And that's why this is specifically called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So you can, end-stage NAFLD is cirrhosis. Now, not every, thankfully, not everyone progresses to that stage. But it's important to remember, it's a very common, if 100 million people have it, it's ultimately a very common form of cirrhosis in the United States. Diagnosis is still a tissue biopsy, a liver biopsy. That's an invasive procedure. Uh, unfortunately, a biochemical marker for NAFLD does not exist. You can be sure that there are many drug companies uh, working aggressively on this problem, both in the United States and in Europe. 
Europe has the same uh, prevalence of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease as the United States. There may be some variations within specific EU countries, but overall it's a third of the population, very prevalent. Therefore, there's great interest in being able to diagnose this problem because I say, as I said in the beginning, it's a silent disease. There's great interest in diagnosing this problem and if it can be done through a biochemical marker, a blood test, uh, that would be foundationally you know, changing for the management of this disease. Lots of times people will say, well, I had my blood work done and my liver enzymes are normal. I would say, well, that's good, but that doesn't mean you don't have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. If your liver enzymes become altered because of NAFLD, you really have end-stage disease or you have a more aggressive type of non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. So please remember that no alteration in your liver enzymes does not mean you do not have NAFLD, okay? What happens when the biopsy is done? Uh, it is examined pathologically under a microscope and you have to have greater than 5% of your hepatocytes, which is the medical term for liver cell, uh, marked with the accumulation of glycogen and become swollen. If you looked at the cells under a microscope, they actually are larger and more swollen like an over-distended balloon. Now the good news about NASH and NAFLD, they are both reversible diseases. So if you remove the insult or the injury, it will revert back to normal. It does take time. There have been several studies on this to show the reversibility of this disease. So that's a very good thing. If it's left unchecked, however, as you can see in the slide, uh, the liver starts to form fibrotic cells and scarring. That firmness starts to set in. The sponginess of the liver ceases, becomes a very hard, rigid organ. When Dr. Radicke and I do surgery, uh, we do sleeves, we do bypass, sometimes we will ask your permission to get a liver biopsy. Sometimes we find a liver that has advanced disease to the point of cirrhosis that we didn't know preoperatively because the liver panel is normal. We will, in those instances, take a biopsy of your liver because it's your, in your best interest to know the stage of the disease you have so it can be properly addressed. So just in terms of statistics, 20% of people with NAFLD, so 20% of 100 million people will develop NASH. That's the next stage in this progression and that's when you start to see some significant uh, changes to the liver. It's a hepatitis change and people will say, well doc, I don't have viral hepatitis. And I said, well, I don't mean B, hepatitis B or C. I don't mean you ate you know, some bad food at a restaurant and get hepatitis A. Hepatitis is just a general term for inflammation of the liver cells. As you remember itis from your Latin uh, days, I remember mine in St. Patrick's and getting beat by the nuns. Itis is inflammation, and that never goes away from me. I remember my Latin. Uh, so it's, inf it's inflammation of the liver. Hep hepato is liver. So you could have a viral hepatitis, you can also have an autoimmune hepatitis, but you can also have a diet-induced hepatitis, which is steatohepatitis or NAFLD, okay? And then 3% of those folks with NASH will develop cirrhosis. That's end-stage liver disease. And that has four different stages within itself, which I won't get into this evening, but suffice it to say, when you get to cirrhosis, especially stage three and four cirrhosis, those are irreversible changes to your liver. Okay, some of those people, patients, will move on and require liver transplantation. That's why this is such a significant issue and one that we really have to address. Right now, there is no medical treatment for NAFLD. It's like, oh, you know, you go to the doctor and you have a, a, a bacterial infection, give you an antibiotic. You have high blood pressure, we'll give you a pill to lower your blood pressure. Well, you can't go to the doctor right now and say, well, I have NAFLD and the doctor's gonna give me this pill and it's gonna get better. That doesn't exist. There are a couple, uh, there's actually a vitamin I'll speak about in a little bit that's helpful, does carry some risk factors. Don't want you to start it without checking with your own doctor or if I'm your doctor, you can check with me personally in the office. Uh, and there is another medication which I won't get into, but my point is 
the mainstay of therapy right now for NAFOLD and NASH is lifestyle modification. It's really the gold standard because it does work and it's important to know that. Weight loss, obviously, uh, not everybody that has fatty liver disease is a candidate for bariatric surgery. So that's why we separated weight loss from bariatric surgery. If you need to lose 20, 30, 40 pounds, that's not a bariatric surgery candidate, that's just kind of lifestyle modifications. It's very likely that if you're in that category, you do have fatty liver disease. And it's very important to lower your body mass index. Exercise is one of the mainstays of therapy. And then dietary interventions. They studied this really well, a hypocaloric diet. Uh, for those people that were under 200 pounds, with obesity disease, they were limited to 1,200 calories a day, and those over 200 pounds were limited to 1,500 calories a day. And they were able to, to completely eliminate NAFL disease within 12 months uh, within this study. So it is doable. It becomes more difficult to lower your body mass index when you've developed NAFL and you're diabetic, okay? Because then you really have derangement of your metabolism and oftentimes people will develop metabolic syndrome and this is something we can speak about specifically in the office when you come and see us but this is a different kettle of fish and it's more challenging to lose weight I won't say impossible but it's more challenging the pharma therapy studies have shown that vitamin E is beneficial in, in reversing natural disease along with weight loss and exercise there are certain risk factors in vitamin E. It can increase your risk of bleeding. Studies have also shown increased risk of prostate cancer in older men and increased, slightly increased risk of hemorrhagic stroke in older men. So in, in that's usually in doses over 400 uh, IU daily. So you know, don't rush out and buy your bottle of vitamin E tomorrow based on solely on what I'm saying. It is a very good vitamin to take. It is a fat-soluble vitamin, so you can increase your levels too much, but check with your doctor. It is a natural way to treat NAFOL disease. And then obviously bariatric surgery. Uh, when you do have obesity disease, your BMI is 35 or 40 or higher. Uh, bariatric surgery is the most uh, successful and aggressive uh, manner to reverse NAFOL and NASH syndrome. Uh, and this is something we see regularly. It's not uncommon sometimes, to, as I said, to find cirrhosis in a, in a patient that has never drank in their life, but that has a BMI of 50 or 55. Just did a surgery recently. We found that. We went ahead and did the surgery, and a lot of that insult will be reversed. So uh, it's not like you say, oh, throw the towel in, it's too late. No. The liver is a remarkable organ. If you stop hurting it, it will recover, it will recover. It's like you know being in the rink with Mike Tyson. If you can manage to leave, you will get better, okay? But you're not gonna look good when you leave. And these are the options. Of course, many of you are familiar with them from our program. It ties in nicely to the last slide of bariatric surgery, the ruin my gastric bypass, the sleeve gastrectomy, and the switch which is a combination of a sleeve and a bypass on the intestine. Very effective surgery. Uh, I've spoken about these ad nauseum through the years. Uh, I won't torture everybody with a lot of it this evening. I really wanted to concentrate on the NAFOLD. Uh, but remember, suffice it to say, the bypass and the switch for that matter are restrictive and malabsorptive. Okay, they're gonna restrict the amount you eat and you're gonna have some malabsorption of your calories. Whereas the sleeve is generally restrictive for the most part, making your stomach very small and biochemical and the fact that you have decreased ghrelin levels. Important to remember that. As a background, you know coverage for our surgery. Uh, we will help you find out if you have coverage, if you wanna undergo bariatric surgery, our office will contact your insurance company and find out if you have the benefit. You yourself can call. You can also check with your human resources department or your employer, and they will generally know if you have coverage.
Just so everyone is very clear, we are a fully accredited center with the American College of Surgeons. We refer to it as MBSAQIP, and we're also a Florida Blue Distinction Center for Bariatric Surgery. Obviously, we've met a list of very stringent criteria. All of our outcomes are continually monitored so that I can look at you and tell you we run a very safe program. Your safety is the most important thing in the entire process of undergoing bariatric surgery. So you get a quality operation with a quality outcome. It's very important to remember that. I'll also give Barbara Allen, our nurse practitioner, a plug. She runs the free support group and classes. And now that we're coming out of COVID, we're going to actually meet again in person, like you can see another human being instead of uh, Facebook Live. Nothing wrong with that. We're doing it now. But uh, it's nice to be able to meet in person. We do a lot of surgeries here on people in the community. And people like to see people and look at their progress and actually talk to them. So we would ask that you make a reservation. But uh, we are doing that. And I believe it's the uh, fourth Tuesday of every month. Uh, don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure. I'm not invited, so that's why I don't remember. I'm invited once a year. Usually Barbara invites me. If she's got no one else, she calls me. Uh, what's the next step? Obviously, set up an appointment to, with us. If you want to know if you have NAFOLD, uh, come and see us. Uh, you don't even necessarily need surgery, because we can speak about the implications of NAFOLD disease uh, and how it can impact your life. I do want to uh, take a couple questions that we got during the presentation. Just been asked at what age is NAFOLD most common? Well, remember, uh, one in 10 children develop NAFOLD disease or non-alcoholic fatty uh, liver disease. So it's, it's age indiscriminate. Uh, believe it or not, on race, it seems to be more prevalent in the Asian and Indian community and then in the Caucasian, and then in the African-American community in terms of ethnicity, uh, seem to get the least amount of NAFOL disease. So we don't know why that occurs, uh, but I'll just throw that in because I thought of uh, doesn't really have an age uh, at all, and it does, but it does have an ethnicity. Uh, are there certain foods? I also got this question. Are there certain foods or habits that can cause NAFOL? Well. It's basically the sugary foods because people say, well, you said fatty liver disease, doctor. What are you talking about sugar? Well, remember, sugar is shuttled to the liver as glucose. Glucose becomes glycogen. That's a fat, OK? So sugar can be converted to fat. And that's what's important to remember. Uh, how can it be prevented? Well, it's the low sugar diet, OK? Eating healthy foods. Uh, if you're eating a diet rich in high fructose corn syrup, again, I'm not condemning anyone. I'm just saying, if you're eating high fructose corn syrup in your diet, and that can be by way of a soda, or even, even you even have to look at some yogurts that are sold in the supermarket. You'd be amazed if you start label reading of what we put in our bodies. Uh, you really have to take a look at it. And if you can't pronounce many of those things, I would put it back on the shelf. Uh, those are the diseases, excuse me, those are the foods that can cause those diseases if you're eating them habitually, OK? Those are the foods. Uh, next question, how can it be prevented? You want to stay away from these foods, obviously, OK? Uh, how much are the bariatric, oh, the bar in, in terms of the cost of the bariatric surgery, it's typically covered by insurance. If it is not, we have some of the most competitive prices in the state of Florida for uh, self-pay or private pay bariatric surgery. And I would encourage you to look at our website, contact our, our office yourself to get those exact amounts. But I know they're very competitively priced, and I know it's much safer than traveling to Mexico. Not that there aren't some very good surgeons in Mexico. I know several of them. Uh, if you have trouble after your surgery, you're going to have big trouble because the doctors here aren't going to want to take care of you. Uh, I did get, we did get a question from uh, Jane. Is this why you gave us a special diet before surgery, because of NAFOLD risk? That's a great question, Jane. It's partly, partly the answer, yes. So 
You won't reverse NAFOLD with a two-week preoperative diet, but what you can do is significantly reduce the glycogen burden, okay, in the liver. And that will help with the surgery, it'll help with your re recovery from the surgery. So that's a great question. Remember, NAFOLD's gonna take six to 12 months to reverse without surgery if you're very aggressive about it. Remember the hypocaloric diet and the exercise program I spoke about earlier. Or in the event you got bariatric surgery, <clears throat> excuse me, and you would see that result in about nine to 12 months as well. Keisha asked the question, what's the difference between primary biliary cirrhosis and NAFOLD? That's a great question. So primary biliary cirrhosis is, a, is another problem unrelated to NAFOLD disease, okay? Uh, biliary cirrhosis typically can mean an autoimmune problem or it can also have uh, an infectious problem. So that's, that is the distinguishing characteristic, for, characteristic uh, from NAFOLD. So it's important to remember that, but, but great. Uh, question. We also got a question, I had an, uns an unsuccessful lap band, is there an option for me? Absolutely. Uh, last week, I just took a band out and gave the person a bypass. Uh, uh, we do this all the time. There were over 300,000 lap bands put in the United States in the early part of uh, 2010, 2011. I remember the rage there where everyone was putting them in. Uh, now we take them out. Uh, the lap band is not a good long-term solution to obesity disease, so do not get down on yourself if you have not been successful. Uh, most people with a lap band were successful for a period of time. It was generally somewhere between a week and a year out, and you did well. Uh, and then you got the band tightened, you were never able to get back in that kind of restricted zone, and you never able to get your BMI back down after it went back up. Don't put yourself down. That only creates a vicious cycle where you're going to self-medicate sometimes with food. So do not do that. Uh, we can take your lap band out. If you're interested in other surgery, we can help you. If you want to take the medical route, it's always open to you. Uh, but we've done lots of successful surgeries. Uh, band to sleeve, band to bypass are great options for you. How do I lose weight if I've regained that? Yeah, so that's a, I just touched on that. It's very difficult to do. Uh, we can do some lap band adjustments for you. I don't wanna take the wind out of your sails. It's hard to achieve. It's hard to achieve. Lap band is not a good solution for long-term management of obesity disease. We thought it was. Obesity disease is a tough disease, as we all know, and lap band doesn't cut it. So it generally needs to be cut out. How long does it take for your hair to regrow after anesthesia? Uh, that's a great question. I have not had anesthesia. That's not why my hair is not regrowing, uh, just so you know. Uh, usually it's, you're gonna have some hair loss after this surgery, somewhere between three and six months out, it generally will stop. Remember to always take your supplement, your multivitamin, plus zinc and biotin that will help slow down the hair loss. Uh, and about six months out, it will stop. Eight months out, it will stop. It will not, it will usually grow back in. We got another question from another. Cheryl says she's had her gallbladder out after surgery, after two years from her bypass, is that normal? It happens about five to 7% of the time. It does happen. It is normal uh, and we take it out. You know, we don't, we, there are some doctors that will take them out prophylactically. I think if you're not having symptoms, it doesn't need to be removed. Taking out of the gallbladder on a person with a high BMI it has its own complication risks uh, in and of it by itself and you don't need to increase that. If you're having symptoms from your gallbladder, your gallbladder should be taken out at the time of your bariatric surgery, but the incidence of it, you developing cholecystitis or inflammation from your gallbladder after your bariatric surgery, as I said, it's only somewhere, depending on what study you read, between five and seven, five and eight percent, it doesn't warrant a prophylactic removal at the time of your surgery. 
How would, how would I know if I have NAFLD if I've never had bariatric surgery? That's a great question. So right now, as you know, there's, I mentioned no blood test you can get. We call that biochemical marker. Uh, really imaging is the main way that most people are gonna find out. What do I mean by imaging? Ultrasound or CT scan. Those are two modalities. Uh, obviously, ultrasound has no radiation, it's less expensive. Can the radiologist can, based on the, what's called the echogenicity and the texture uh, and the size of your liver, give you an idea if you have NAFLD disease. The gold standard, of course, is a liver biopsy. That can be done as a needle biopsy by a special doctor called an interventional radiologist. Uh, we can also do liver biopsies, but of course they're more invasive when we do them. We, you know, because we're surgeons, we go in either you know, laparoscopic or robotic, we can get a biopsy. But the best way to find out if you haven't had bariatric surgery is imaging. The answer to your question is ultrasound or CT. And can I die from NAFLD? Well, remember, a certain percentage of patients, 20% will develop NASH, 3% will develop cirrhosis, a certain percentage of those patients, uh, if they don't intervene and take appropriate steps, can die from their end-stage liver disease. Yes, end-stage liver disease is, is a deadly problem. And uh, I know of, and it's a well-known fact, of people on the liver transplant list uh, that never receive an organ, unfortunately, because of the shortage of organs. So to answer your question is, is it possible? Yes. It's <clears throat> unlikely, but it is possible. NAFLD is not hereditary. Another good question. It's dietary induced, so it is not hereditary. And we also got a question from Jane. Is there a limit, age limit for bariatric surgery? She's now 63. Uh, 63 is fine. Uh, Dr. Radeke and I have done bariatric surgery on octogenarians. We've done it. I've done revisions on 80-year-olds. Uh, not always for weight loss, but because they may have had another problem. So, you know, we live in Florida. Uh, for those of you that don't live in Florida and are watching from somewhere else, uh, we have a lot of healthy older people down here. Uh, I had a gentleman a few months ago that was uh, 100 years old, drove to my office to see me, and he looked better than I did. Uh, and so we get a lot of older folks that are quite healthy. And so we have to look at everyone individually. That's my point. So there's no hard cutoff for age. We're not gonna say, oh, you're 70, you can't have surgery. We really gotta look at the picture because there's other patients that come to my, our office uh, who might be 55, who might, for another reason, not be a candidate for surgery. So age in and of itself, we don't discriminate. And I think that's it for questions. I wanna thank you very much for viewing the uh, presentation tonight and being a part of it. Thank you for your questions. I hope this was important to you. And take home message is liver disease is real and it's associated with obesity. And uh, take your diet and your lifestyle seriously because it matters. So thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you again. Uh, you'll see Dr. Radeke next month. Bye-bye.